But I think one of the things we've learned is that um, to have the sorts of practices that we've developed, um, it's really good to be practicing those kind of all the time. So when you're in difficult situations, you have those tools at hand to deal with the really the the challenges. Um, and what better time to want to be drawing on your body wisdom and knowing how your particular body works than when things are going wrong. So when we're sick or when we're ill or even when we're dying, to a certain extent there will be other people who can help us with that task. But ultimately, we are the ones that have the most efficacy usually. We're the ones who can say, no, this thing you're trying to do to me, that actually doesn't make things better, it makes it worse. Or once you've done your things and you've left me in my room, what do I do then? You know, so if we have these tools about listening to our experience um, and, and then be able to make good choices out of that uh, is, you know, is a really powerful thing. So for example, I've, I've had a couple, not, not, not recently, but a while ago I've had some pretty serious back trouble and a couple of times have been in bed for a while. Um, and one of the things I learned early on was that it was actually better for me if I kept working, like uh, even having my laptop and, and working so that I was engaged with something, you know, as opposed to just lying there. So uh, other people might be thinking, well, you should just rest. But that didn't really work for me. Um, so to be able to pay attention to that and follow that wisdom. So, the, you know, the play and the fun part, it's like, that's not necessarily the, en all, the only end result of what we're looking for. It's, it's, it's a good sign. Um, and it's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a noble end. If people say, that was fun, you know, we, yes, <laughs> good, <laughs> check that off the list, we've done that. Um, but there's also just all the things that you learn out of, this, out, out of these processes that then you can use in difficult times, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when you need it the most. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to learn those tools when you're in difficult times, mm -hmm. do you know? So suddenly if I'm faced with with whatever, now that's not the time for me to try to learn how to meditate necessarily. It's helpful if I already know how to meditate uh, or any other practice, you know, as opposed to um, when, when the trouble really comes, so. I think we, uh, our colleagues, for instance, Marie Garlock is doing a lot of work with, uh, can around cancer, and her mom died of cancer. She's a uh, PhD in performance studies and an in interplayer. She's teaching doctors and chaplains, as well as cancer survivors uh, and people dealing with it directly, how to have their stories, how to have the personal experience back in the room, um, how to have the body fully present. And, uh, you know, these easy tools and ways that we can do it in without going out and creating a whole dance, right? You don't have to get on a stage. Uh, people being able to bring their story and experience forward in any subject matter uh, is empowering for people. And that whenever people are feeling empowered to have their truth, I think their serotonin increases, their dopamine increases, <laughs> you know, their life force uh, starts to feel cohesive and meaningful. So if, they, if people are dying, living with that, um, we all are dying and living, uh, we are in a sense, better in ourselves. But I mean, I don't know about better, but just where we, we feel well, or more well. That's what I love about improvisation is that there are these things that come out um, that I have not necessarily completely figured out, that I mostly have not figured out beforehand. We're just trying to expand what we might do and see what happens when we do that. And there might be something that's fun in that. There might be something that's illuminating. There might be some that, something that's helpful or releasing or encouraging or uh, whatever that might be. Uh, but mostly what we're, you know, we're asking people to consider this basic question about what does the body do? And then more specifically, what does your body do? Uh, and as we ask people to do these different things, they are behaving in different ways. You could see that as a separation. But you know, when you use the language of role and role playing, there's the sense of, okay, I'm gonna step out of something, you know, and then I'm probably gonna step back in. Um, and there, there is a definite stepping in in terms of stepping into the form. So there's just the structural part of, at this point, I'm gonna be doing this thing and I may be behaving in a way that I don't normally behave. 
Um, but we really see that ultimately as parts of ourselves. And our hope is actually that they can integrate those possibilities in other ways in their lives. So even though the you know, there are a lot of things that I only do in interplay situations that I don't tend to do in other parts of my life. I might, I could, um, and oftentimes it's enough for me as an introvert just to imagine I could do that. I could skip down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably not gonna, <laughs> but I could. Um, I, so I think, I, I mean, I see it really more as a process of let's let ourselves do what we're capable of doing. Um, and in that process, we're going to find, we're going to find other parts. Uh, and whether people experience that as a stepping out of themselves or not is actually, I mean, it's not really my concern uh, personally. Um, I'm sure there are people who have that experience. Oh gosh, who, who was that and who did that thing? And actually, I, I'd have to say that sometimes I have that experience. Where did that come from? Um, and I'm kind of at the place where. I'm willing to consider that what is coming out, you know, the, the process, what I love about improvisation is that there are these things that come out um, that I have not necessarily completely figured out, that I mostly have not figured out beforehand. Well, for instance, I, you know, creating, using creative practices that are open-ended around a subject like living and dying, and how do we do that? I mean, to me, this, these are the old ways. Th this is like big news, but the old ways ha had these things bound together implicitly. Rituals and practices that were improvisational. They were not hard set in the ground, you know, the, the ancient ways. They were structured, but they were alive with change. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I wasn't there, <laughs> but I've, you know, in my studies, I'm pretty sure that an open system is inherent to a living system. You know, especially if you don't have books and stuff like that. You've got to have some codification, but people have to know. So, death, I, like I, uh, my, co my, my colleague and husband, Stephen, um, and I do the Dying to Live tour in Cabaret, which uses interplay practices to approach the questions and the body wisdom of death and dying. But we've witnessed quite a bit of it within our community and friends. And for those who are willing, who are already engaged in a practice like this, the ability to notice uh, what their experience or what we call their body data uh, and to be able to engage it with creative practice, um, with, some, with some amazing senses of humor, but also really tr deep grief, full on, the full expression. Um, but uh, understand how we begin and end that, that we don't see that as forever, right? Um, the community, uh, communities that gather around people who are going through this process, are extraordinary that we actually can dance on behalf of one another. We can um, leave each other alone, you know, uh, but do so at, at a distance, engage with one another. 